Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Aviva Rothman. Uh, Aviva is Assistant Professor in the Department of History at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, her PhD at Princeton on Kepler's Search for Harmony was supervised by Anthony Grafton, and she's published several articles on Kepler. And her book, The Pursuit of Harmony, Kepler on Cosmos, Confession and Community, was published by Chicago University Press in 2017. She is currently, I believe, working on a book project on science, science and myth in early modernity, and a penguin anthology of texts entitled The Copernican Conversation. Today, uh, Professor Rothman's paper uh, title is Kepler's Epitome of Copernican Astronomy and the Copernican Ban of 1616. Aviva. Just, just Thank you. Oh, go ahead. If there are questions, um, people, please um, just write, write to me as the host of the meeting in the chat. And then I will um, during, during the talk or whenever they occur to you, and I'll be and I'll I'll try and chair the discussion afterwards, or you can just save them up for afterwards, whatever you however you see fit. Thanks, anyway. Go on. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, really lovely to to see all of you coming from so many different places, um, and to have this chance to present my research. Um, I apologize. As an advance, we're all used to, you know, uh, being lectured from by a tiny face uh, next to a PowerPoint slide, but um, I wish I could be there face to face. Um, you know, that, that would certainly be nicer, although, you know, that, this opportunity is, is wonderful as well. So I'm going to, let me see, I'm going to adjust my speaker window so I can see my slides. Hold on one minute and then I will get started. Okay. Um, so today um, I want to tell you a story about Kepler, and it's a story that I think uh, sheds light on how he understood himself and his work, um, and it uses the epitome of Copernican astronomy, which is his uh, astronomical textbook, and it's the place where he offered the most complete account of his full system. So let me flip to the next slide. Okay, here you see um, the three volumes in which the epitome was published. There's um, the first, which was published in 1618, uh, which is on spherical astronomy, the doctrine of the sphere. Um, then there are two uh, later volumes. 1620 is book four, which is on his celestial physics. Um, and 1621 is uh, books five, six, and seven, which is his lunar planetary lunar theory, planetary theory, um, and the final book on precession, um, or what would be called motions of the eighth sphere, although to him, right, this is due to the motion of the earth. Um, so uh, the epitome of Copernican astronomy is an unusual book. Scholars have typically called it a Copernican textbook, but the problem is that it sits fairly uneasily in that genre, and it doesn't seem quite like your typical textbook. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, in the beginning of the very first volume of the book, Kepler seems to frame it as an elementary textbook for beginning students. Um, and this is what he says uh, in the very beginning of the preface. Immediately after I published my commentary on the motions of the planet Mars at the urging of my astronomer friends, I began to prepare an edition of the new astronomy adapted for children at the school bench. For since this science is productively learned only if each child who wants to secure his fruit as an adult has nurtured the seeds as a boy, I wanted to help them with a model that was easily understood, low in price and appropriately rich. Right, so it's intended as a starting text for people learning this subject afresh. But it becomes especially apparent in the later books and even sometimes uh, for these earlier ones that the readers of the epitome didn't quite feel that way. Sometimes even advanced readers, sometimes even professors of mathematics. So I give you um, as one example, um, this quote um, by Prof uh, Peter Kruger, professor of mathematics after reading book four. The poet says that a reading repeated 10 times should be pleasing, but I still don't understand this. After 100 repetitions, the author seems deliberately to obscure the matter, as is his custom. So what's going on, right? Um, first, I thought maybe we could uh, compare it to a couple of other epitomies just to get a sense of what this genre is. So the most famous epitome of the era is uh, Poirbach and Regimontanus' Epitome of the Almagest. Um, which summarized Ptolemaic astronomy, but did move well beyond it, uh, was a primary resource for practicing astronomers, including for Copernicus himself. 
and was used in university classrooms because it was easier to follow me to follow than Ptolemy himself, but was typically a resource for more advanced astronomy students. It wasn't something that would be readily understood by beginners. By contrast, uh, Michael Meslin's epitome of astronomy, Meslin, of course, being Kepler's teacher himself, uh, was specifically intended for non-specialists, for beginning students in the arts, those unskilled in mathematics, those who had to take an astronomy course as part of their liberal arts curriculum. Um, it didn't adopt the Copernican system, though Meslin himself was a Copernican, and this too was a choice based on its target audience. Meslin typically taught the Copernican system only to advanced students whom he felt would benefit from it, but didn't feel it was appropriate for starting students who wouldn't need to know, you know, how astronomy had moved on. Had moved on. Um, and by the end of the 16th century, it's among the most popular of astronomical textbooks. So Kepler's epitome um, at first glance seems uh, most similar to Meslin's. And in fact, Kepler described it this way. Um, he writes as he's planning it that the book is crafted in imitation of the first book on the spheres by Meslin. Uh, it has the same title as Meslin's book with the addition of Copernican, right? So Meslin's is epitome of astronomy and here we have epitome of Copernican astronomy. Uh, it's written in question and answer format, which is fairly unusual for astronomical textbooks of the time um, and published in cheap octavo form both of which are true of Meslin's textbook, but not of Horbach and Regimontanus's. So all this suggests that he, like Meslin, uh, intends to follow the model of the textbook for the beginner. He's crafting it on the basis of Meslin's model. He wants to reach out to beginners. He also continues in his preface to the first book to emphasize this point. He says, you know, there are other books that um, are suitable for beginners that cover this material. He mentions in particular Sacro Bosco and Clavius's commentary on the sphere um, and says that even though these books are available, uh, his book should still have a potential place in the curriculum. And here's what he says. There are different aptitudes for teaching and the same teacher is not appropriate for every student. Further, I mix familiar and necessary definitions and also certain higher speculations as seems suited to the method. For both, I presented things in a question and response form so as not to neglect beginners since it is easier for them to understand and also so adults and those of mature judgment are able to blend the tedium of common and well-known definitions with some recreation. Also, this form of speaking makes it easier to examine more difficult speculations. All right, so his idea is um, my style is somewhat different than others. Different students respond well to different styles. Some beginning students may prefer my own. In fact, he says the question and answer format is intended specifically for this purpose to make it easier for people to access this material. All right, so we have again this focus on the beginning student. And unlike Meslin, who doesn't include Copernican theory in his book, Kepler quite obviously does, but insists that this too is a decision made with the beginning student in mind. And here's what he says. For when you take into account the unique diurnal motion of the earth, a great many other motions are removed. And when you take into account the unique annual motion of the earth itself, it casts out all the epicycles of the ancients and still further all of their eccentrics upon eccentrics. And though many things may seem absurd initially and difficult to believe when it comes to this axiom of the earth's motion, it happens that if you embrace that subject and first admit the motion of the earth, it is much easier to fashion a universal astronomy and astronomy is made easier to understand in all its parts. All right, so the idea is that both in its format, its question and answer format, its small size um, and in its style and in its content, this is a book that's suitable for the beginning student. Kepler um, emphasizes this focus throughout. And if you just flip through the pages, you can see um, that it does seem to be a book targeted for beginners. I give you the very first question that the book opens with, what is astronomy? Um, Kepler answers that it's a science that relates the causes of things in the, in the heavens, lets us understand past motions and lets us predict future ones, right? So he's explaining this um, as though, you know, from the ground up. Um, and if you flip through the images in the book as well, um, they're often quite whimsical, rough, uh, sometimes printed multiple times when relevant and seem to reinforce the emphasis on young readers. Okay. Um, things are quite different when we come to the preface to book four. So this is all, everything I've shown you thus far um, is from the 1618 um, opening volumes of the book. Uh, in 1620, Kepler puts out book four. So here we are. Um, 
more. Um, and when he talks about the book, you hear him speaking quite differently of the kind of book it is and of the kind of readers for whom it's intended. And I know it's not ideal to throw up tons of text at you on a PowerPoint slide, but I want to show you actually, you know, a little bit of what he says about this book here so you can see what I mean. All right, so this is how he begins the preface to book four. Since the new astronomy had nearly concealed the doctrine of celestial causes among a thicket of numbers and the remaining astronomical trappings, and since the price of the book deterred those with thinner pockets, it seemed to my friends that it would be appropriate for me to fulfill my duties by writing an epitome with the tedium of the demonstration shortened in simple and plain speech. So this is pretty much a repetition of what he said at the start of book one, right? My friends told me after the new astronomy, make this book accessible. I did that. But it seemed to certain people that in the doctrine of the sphere, published three years earlier, right, so that's what we've looked at before, I was more long-winded in the debate about the diurnal motion or rest of the earth than served the plan of an epitome. I therefore thought that if readers did not stomach that part well, even though no epitome of astronomy lacks it, how much more contrary to custom would this fourth part be, which brandishes many new and unexpected things concerning the whole nature of the heavens, so much so that you might doubt whether you were doing a part of physics rather than astronomy, unless you knew that speculative astronomy itself is a whole part of physics. All right. So, you know, emphasizing how much more complicated um, this is going to become. And then he says, therefore, it seemed it would be very appropriate for this book, which was written as much with physics as with astronomy, to be produced separately, so that based on the choice of the astronomer buyer, it could either be omitted or inserted into the rest of the epitome. Okay, so I want to emphasize two things here. First, as you'll see, where I've just underlined, the uh, potential reader is now described differently. This is not children at the school bench, this is astronomer buyer, right? So we're directing the astronomer who might consider buying the book. And this might be so complicated that even that professional astronomer may choose to avoid it. Why may this be so complicated? Here, Kepler emphasizes, um, maybe you can see my underlines, right? the physical nature of the book. This is not your traditional astronomy, which relates uh, positions and predictions and leaves the physics to the natural philosophers. This is physical astro astronomy through and through. Um, this is a non-traditional merging of the disciplines. This may be too much for the book's readers. All right, so the question is what's happened between books one and the late one to three and the later books. And the obvious immediate answer is, well, uh, Kepler didn't realize just how difficult this physical approach would be, right? Is the problem the physical arguments of the epitome? I want to say that this is not the primary difference, only because Kepler is very clear about this from the start of book one. Right? The fact that this was going to be a physical astronomy is planned at the start, is emphasized at the start, is, uh, is shown to the reader from page one. I'll just show you a couple of places where he does this. Right, um, In book one, he says, what is the relationship between this science, astronomy, and other sciences? And his answer is, it is a part of physics because it investigates the causes of natural things and events, and because the motion of celestial bodies are among its subjects. And because its singular goal is to discover the arrangement of the structure of the world and its parts. Um, and says later on, it is appropriate to establish the principles of astronomy first in a higher science, pure physics or metaphysics. The astronomer directs all his pleas by geometrical and physical arguments toward this goal to set before human eyes the genuine form and arrangement or adornment of the whole world. Right. So at the start of book one, he's telling people this is going to be a physical astronomy, that that is how I view my subject and doesn't seem to see this as an impediment to um, the book's use at, for by beginning students. But by book four, he does. He's suggesting that it's so complicated and so physical that this may be a book only for experts. And even those experts may choose to pass over it. And he really doubles down on this. So there's a moment in the preface to book four where he uh, takes the opportunity to counter the imagined objection that the book is so complicated that it may well be useless in universities. Right. And he doesn't say, no, no, this book is useful in universities. He agrees with that, um, but says that people should buy it anyway. So here's what he says. What holds back the academies is that they were introduced in order to shape the studies of those who are learning, and it is in their interest that the laws of teaching not be changed frequently. There, because attention is on the progress of those learning, it frequently happens that things have to be chosen, not because they're especially true, but because they are especially easy. Thus, if some intricate and difficult to understand topics should not be placed before beginners, or if they should not be placed before the accepted and necessary topics, it does not follow that those things ought neither to be written nor read privately. 
right? So I hope you can see that this is a real shift, right? This is not just, um, you know, first I thought it was for beginning students, and now I think maybe some of them will have trouble with it. This is this book is really complicated, so complicated that I get why you wouldn't want to teach it at a university, but you can still buy it privately if you're good enough. Right, that's what he's saying in the um, in the preface, and I I think that this may well have something to do with the fact that the book did get more complicated. Right, um, Kepler's he planned out the topics from the start, but he continued to work through them over the years. Continued to discuss with Meslin the various topics he was struggling with. Lunar theory, in particular, was really hard, and he recognized that the book was getting harder. But what I want to suggest here, and I'll try to prove it to you, is that there's another explanation as well for the shift in framing from the earlier books of the epitome to the later books of the epitome, from the idea of the beginning student to the idea of an expert student. And to understand that shift in framing, we need to move back in time just a little bit to the uh, decree of the index of 1616, the um, ban on um, heliocentric theory promulgated by Copernicus and his followers. And just to remind us, I'll show you the text of the decree, right? The Holy Congregation has learned about the spreading and acceptance by many of the false Pythagorean doctrine, altogether contrary to the Holy Scripture, that the earth moves and the sun is motionless. In order that this opinion may not creep any further to the prejudice of the Catholic truth, the congregation has decided that the books by Nicholas Copernicus on the revolutions of spheres and Diego de Zuniga on Job be suspended until corrected, but that the book of the Carmelite father, Paolo Antonio Foscarini be completely prohibited and condemned and that all other books, and this is the important part, which teach the same be likewise prohibited according to whether with the present decree it prohibits, condemns and suspends them respectively. Okay, so this is the decree. It, spe it spreads unevenly throughout Europe, and its implications are unclear from the start, right? People are not totally sure, even when they've received news of this, what exactly this prohibits, what exactly it wants corrected, right? It, it lists texts, but not specific guidelines. Um, Kepler is living in Linz, Austria at the time. Um, he's struggling to keep abreast of developments in the Republic of Letters. News is coming to him sporadically. Um, he hears rumors about a ban on Copernicus. So in September of 1617, he writes to uh, the chief physician of the imperial court in Prague, Thomas Mingonius, and says, um, I've heard that there might be something going on in Italy with respect to the teachings of Copernicus. What can you tell me? Mingonius first writes back and says, I don't know anything. So in the beginning, even he, even his contacts have failed him there. Um, but two months later, in November of 1617, he writes back to Kepler, um, having learned more. And here's what he says. In Italy, certain limits have been established for philosophers beyond which a Catholic is not able to wander by law. Now, well, he says that he's heard this because he's had a letter from a friend in Padua who wants to sell copies of Kepler's latest ephemerides on the Italian market, but says, I need to see the philosophical sections first to make sure there's no impediment to their sale, right? Um, and this is the reason he gives. So Mangonius relays this to um, Kepler, which is at this moment in November 1617, the first that Kepler has, the first confirmation he's received of the Copernican ban. Um, and what Mangonius does as well um, is forward Kepler, um, I think he sent this slightly earlier, um, a copy of a book um, opposing Copernican doctrine. And he says to, Elliot, to um, Kepler, if you can draft something about the work of that Italian mathematician and theologian against the motion of the earth, which I already sent to you earlier, I beg that you transmit it to me. All right. So the work he's talking about um, here, I give you an imagined rendering of it, is um, a book by the um, Italian theologian Francesco Ingoli, um, who um, wrote a disputation against the motion of the earth after Galileo's 1616 visit to Rome, countering uh, what he perceived as um, Galileo's primary arguments. Um, Galileo himself does not respond fully until his dialogue on the world systems, but what Kepler does when he receives this text is he drafts a thorough response to Ingoli's comments um, and sends them back, sends his response back to Mingonius along with the first three books of the epitome, that first volume, right? And says, send this along, send my response back, send on my epitome. It too contains, you know, reasons for the Copernican system and arguments in favor of it. So Mingonius receives those um, and sends those on to Rome to be read by Ingoli. Okay. Um, in the meantime, Kepler reaches out to his other Italian friends to see if they can give him more information. So he reaches out to Vincenzo Bianchi um, in Venice, 
um, and asks uh, what he knows about what's going on in Italy. Here's what he says. We Germans lack letters relating to Italy, and I want to know whether it's possible that the book, and he's talking about here about the harmony of the world, which is in preparation, can be sold in Italy, for it supports the opinion of Copernicus. But nothing is in it contrary to Catholicism, although that opinion was recently marked by a certain censure, though it is still private. For it is not only in that book that I defend the motion of the earth, but also elsewhere in the commentary on Mars, in the optics, in the new book on the star, in the epitome of Copernican astronomy, etc. So what I want to note here is first, um, Kepler doesn't fully understand the Copernican ban when he says it's still private. He seems to think that it's still being debated in some way, that maybe it relates specifically to Galileo. He's not sure. And he's worried about all of his books, but specifically about the harmony of the world, which is about to come out. OK, uh, Bianchi writes back, I would claim nothing further concerning the motion of the Earth or very little because the opposition to Copernicus is recent and the censure is growing impassioned. I would pass over this question so that the books not be mutilated by Rome. Nevertheless, the books of illustrious German authors, although prohibited at some time, are still secretly sold and read attentively. All right, so good news and bad news. The good, the bad news, right, is that the ban is serious. You really don't want to talk about this if you don't want your books being flagged. The good news is that even if your book is banned, uh, it might make people more interested in it, right? <laughs> it might be read still more attentively if it's subject to censure by the index because people will recognize it as something of interest. This did not comfort Kepler. <laughs> and what he writes back is this, I see that the censure has been brought forth and published, right, which he had not known until then. And otherwise I had believed until now that it was in deliberation and had not yet been reinforced by the authority of the Pope. And then he wonders what to do. Should I act as an advocate for Copernicus to the censors and moreover, as an advocate of his disciples, not even for myself or for Germans who do not follow the Roman church, but for Italians who are all subservient to Rome, or should I take no action, right? The question is, uh, the ban is likely to do little to affect him where he is. Um, you know, despite some opposition to Copernican theory among Lutherans, Copernican books are still taught at Lutheran universities, right? Um, the Pope's authority um, does not extend as far as to ban them, you know, um, in Kepler's home ground. Um, but uh, should, he, should he continue to worry about what's happening in Italy? Should he take up the question there? What should he do? Uh, it turns out the question was already out of his hands. Um, and he learns this from his friend, Johannes Remus Quietanus, um, who was a German physician and astronomer who had eventually moved to Rome and is writing to him from Rome. And this is what Remus writes to him. Galileo wanted your Copernican book, which was prohibited and cannot be had in Rome. <laughs> that letter, by the way, is, you know, one of the original uh, Galileo to Kepler letters. I just put it there as a, you know, as a prompt. Um, but um, your Copernican book is prohibited. Kepler does not know what this means. Um, I received your letter from your letter, the first news that my book was prohibited in Rome and Florence, nor do I fully understand which Copernican book you speak of, for all my books are Copernican, even the prologues to the ephemerides. Moreover, the harmonica is not yet published. I therefore suspect that your words were about the epitome of astronomy. Please send to me a description of the formal words of the censure and indicate whether the author would be guilty of a crime if it were intercepted in Italy. Right? So Kepler is right. The book Remus has mentioned is the epitome of astronomy, which has been reviewed and censured and placed on the index in 1619. And it turns out that Kepler likely set this ban into motion himself when he responded to Ingoli's uh, disputation against the motion of the earth with both you know, a long set of responses and the epitome, right? So that gets sent directly to Ingoli who reads the book and is somewhat worried by what he finds inside of it. And I'll give you first the, um, uh, what Ingoli actually says about the book. Now I should note that Ingoli is not poorly disposed toward Kepler himself, or not extremely poorly disposed. He begins his comments, and I don't quote that here, by saying, Kepler seems like a nice upstanding fellow who has unfortunately been seduced by the Lutheran devils, <laughs> right? Um, the book too, he finds um, interesting and exciting. Um, he says, the book is very elaborate and beautiful, but he notes two primary problems um, that he has found within it. All right. I noted two errors in this volume. First, he believes and defends as very true the system of Copernicus concerning the positions and motions of the earth against the sacred scriptures and the determination made by this sacred congregation about which it seems likely that he knew because the book was printed in the second year after the prohibition of Copernicus. So pause here and note that Ingoli is wrong, right? As we saw, Kepler did not know about the 1616 decree by the time um, the 1618 copy of the epitome was published, but Ingoli thinks he did. 
And with obscure words, he insults theologians and all those books which condemn the theory of Copernicus as false. Problem one. Problem two is that he asserts that the sun is ensouled. This error, moreover, is one of those of Oregon, which the Fifth Council of Constantinople con condemned. I know that this error also still arises among others because several times I had the opportunity of debating against those who hold that the heavens and the heavenly bodies are animated by soul and intelligence. Therefore, it would perhaps not be beyond our purpose to deliberate concerning this quickly so that innovating natural philosophers of whom today there are many are prevented from progressing further. So if you read these, if you read the actual opinion, it seems that Ingoli is more concerned about the second error than the first, right? Um, he himself had emphasized to the congregation of the index that Copernican theory was useful and had suggested, as happened, that it not be banned entirely, but that it be amended, right? So that it could be sold with its errors expurgated. By contrast, when it came to Kepler's book, he recommended a full-on ban. Um, and as his words suggest here, it seems to be he's, that he's primarily concerned about the idea of an animate sun. He doesn't like this, uh, this heresy and wants it fully eliminated, doesn't want people to have the chance to read it. So that seems to be his primary concern. But Remus does not seem to have read uh, the ban itself very carefully and assumes, like Kepler, that it has something to do with his Copernicanism. Um, so this is what he writes to Kepler when Kepler asks for wording of the censure. Um, I, oh, Kepler also sends a copy of the Epitome to Galileo, who wants it and can't get it. I received your letter with a copy of the Epitome of Copernican Astronomy, and the Epitome will be sent on to Galileo right away. I do not think the book will be prohibited, except insofar as it speaks against the decree of the Holy Office from two years ago. Um, this was due to a certain Neapolitan cleric who was spreading this opinion in Italy to the public in the vernacular from which dangerous consequences and opinions were arising. Right, and here he's speaking about um, Foscarini's letter on the mobility of the earth, right? So the problem is that Foscarini was spreading it publicly and in the vernacular, um, and Galileo too was then discussing his cause with too much inflexibility at the same time in Rome. In the same manner, Copernicus was corrected, at least in the beginning of book one for a few lines, these books nevertheless, and also I think your book, The Epitome, can certainly be read with a license by the learned and expert in this art in Rome and throughout all of Italy. Therefore, there is no cause for you to be afraid, either in Italy nor in Austria, only keep yourself within your limits and rule over your emotions. Right. So Remus is specifically emphasizing the attitudes um, and paths of the people who promoted Copernicanism, Foscarini and Galileo, as reasons for the censure. Foscarini was too public. Galileo was too fractious and, you know, steadfast in his ways, too inflexible. Had they done things differently, maybe things would have gone differently. And um, Foscarini, uh, sorry, um, Remus was correct that, you know, when the um, index decided what books to uh, ban or censure, um, they did make certain kinds of demarcations, right? So there is a distinction between popular and scholarly audiences. Um, they're often particularly worried about popular audiences who may not have the skill to distinguish between ideas that are right and ideas that are wrong um, and don't want problematic ideas getting into their hands. Um, this aligns too with a distinction between vernacular and Latin texts, and this can go both ways. Sometimes censors are more willing to uh, ban vernacular texts because they're worried about them falling in the hands of less educated people who won't be able to make the necessary distinctions. Sometimes they're more willing to ban Latin texts because their reach is farther, right? So it depends on the kind of book, um, and it depends on whether you're thinking about a kind of vertical or horizontal spread. But regardless, Remus is right that the um, Censors of the index do often allow special licenses for experts and scholars. And the idea is that these are people who can be trusted to read the books and take from them what's important for their studies while rejecting the problematic components, right? And this is conveyed um, to Kepler by Remus. So it's 1619, Kepler's book has just been placed on the index and it's the exact same moment in time that his Harmony of the World, right? The culmination of all of his work, the book that he's most excited to get out there um, is about to come out. 
And Kepler is really worried that the ban on his epitome will affect his harmony of the world, right? He, he contemplates actually uh, changing the book itself, maybe adding something to the introduction, uh, but it's so close to publication that he decides against it and instead writes up what he calls an admonition to foreign book dealers, especially Italians, which he prints on a separate sheet and asks to have inserted in the copies of the Harmony of the World um, before it's sold. Um, and letter addressed directly to those booksellers, and here is what he says. Okay, I have written this as a German in the German manner and frankness, yet I am a Christian, a son of the church, and I not only embrace Catholic doctrine willingly, but also judge it to be true. Therefore, be assured that the things in this book can bring you neither censure nor should they be shunned. Difficulty arises only in the annual motion of the earth around the sun because of the importunity of certain people who put forth astronomical doctrines, doctrines in the wrong place and in an inappropriate manner, right? So he is emphasizing the idea that Galileo and Foscarini went about it all the wrong way. The result was that the reading of Copernicus, which was completely unconstrained for almost 80 years when it was dedicated to Pope Paul III, is henceforth suspended until the work is corrected, right? Emphasizing here that the church had no problem with the theory at the start. Right? and that it's only recently that problems have arisen. And then in the letter, Kepler um, abandons his own typical modesty um, and says, this may be my fault. I confess my own guilt for having delayed too long in my own work. I have left philosophy without a defense. For indeed, if I am not wrong, when this harmonic work is read by the most learned Italian philosophers and the most devout theologians, they will conclude that so great is the majesty and sublimity of the divine works in this harmonic framework that Copernicus could by no means be sufficiently understood before the promulgation of this work. Therefore, philosophy and Copernicus beg for a new judgment, right? So the idea is, my books are the best defense of Copernican theory there can be. And if you put them in the record, right, perhaps the church will judge things differently. They will see that these, the Copernican theory supports Christian doctrine, um, right, rather than contradicts it. So he sees himself as, you know, one of the defenders of Copernicus and perhaps a reason why the church might change, his, change its mind. And so he ends by telling the booksellers this. You booksellers will certainly act properly if you do not sell copies of the book to the public in deference to the censure, but know this, you serve philosophy and good authors too, almost as legal clerks who send defenses to the judges. Therefore, sell copies of the book only to the highest theologians, the most famous of philosophers, the most practiced of mathematicians, and the most profound of metaphysicians, whom I, as an agent of Copernicus, cannot approach in any other way, right? So you see him very clearly here saying, my book has very specific readers. They are the best of the best, the most expert of the most expert. Send it to them. You're, you're, you're basically like the legal clerk. This is a, a brief in defense of Copernicus. They're the judges. You need to get this book into their hands so they can reevaluate things, right? So we see a clear emphasis on expert readers, which when Kepler forwarded this to Bianchi, right, the, his uh, Venetian correspondent who had told him to be careful, uh, Bianchi understood that this was what Kepler was doing, right? So this is what he says uh, to Kepler. What, because the coarse and unlearned will not easily grasp your lessons, you therefore may no longer teach the wise? Aristotle wrote the books of the physics not for the dull Greek public, but particularly for the philosophers of Athens. Thus you will deliver the volumes of the harmonies, not to the common men, but to the highest men, as I already see you have indicated in your admonition to the booksellers full of eloquence, dignity, and reverence. And so Bianchi takes Kepler as his word and believes that Kepler actually only intends the harmony of the world to be read by these, you know, highest of experts. But if you actually read the harmony of the world, it's pretty clear that this is not at all what Kepler <laughs> intends. All right, I just give you one example of what he says in the book itself. I wish I could have made my discussion still more popular, provided that it was also clearer and more accessible. I relate geometrical matters and materials in a popular way. If readers are completely unacquainted with mathematical matters, they should pass over my expositions and read only the propositions and putting confidence in the propositions themselves without proof, they should pass on to the remaining books, especially the last. They should not be frightened off by the difficulty of the geometrical arguments and deprive themselves of the very great enjoyment of harmonic studies. Right? Kepler emphasizes this again and again throughout the book. The harmony of the world is his, the culmination of his defense of Copernicus. His habit has always been to cast a wide net and try to convince as many people as possible that Copernican theory is true from the bottom to the top. This is something he continues in the harmony of the world. And it's only in the admonition to the booksellers that he suggests that the book has a different audience. 
Right? So what I think you can see there is that this is not a case, right, of, you know, for example, Copernicus, who says mathematics is written for mathematicians, right? You who don't know mathematics don't enter here. This, for Kepler, the admonition to the booksellers, is a very specific response to a very difficult situation, right? The question is, how can his books read, reach readers in Italy if the church is about to ban them? And the solution is, well, Remus has said the church will grant licenses to experts. Let me reorient my book so that it seems like that, that that's their intended audience. And what he does essentially, I'm arguing, is perform his own act of censorship on the book, right? Not on its content, but on its framing, right? Um, by sort of reorienting it toward those experts alone, at least when it comes to Italy. Um, and the idea is that this is the first step, right? If the book can reach those expert readers, and if they change their minds, and if the ban is lifted, then the book can reach uh, general readers. Right, who, who will have renewed access to it. So I want to suggest that the same thing is true of the epitome, right, at least in part. Um, in book one, which is written before Kepler knows of the ban, he plans it to be a book that will reach as many readers as possible. I'll give you just uh, one other example of that from, you know, book one. I make it my job to persuade as many people as, this, as possible. By this plan, I will enjoy agreeing with the majority with the greatest pleasure. Right. Um, by book uh, four, as we've seen, um, he we see it clear about face. Right. I'll just give you the example again. If some intricate and difficult to understand topics should not be placed before beginners or if they should not be placed before the accepted and necessary topics, it does not follow that those things ought neither to be written nor read privately. Right. So what I'm arguing is that we see a shift from one to the other, a shift in the framing of readers from beginners to experts, and that that shift is more readily understood when you think about the larger context and the shift in framing of the harmony too. All right. So just to, to be clear, I'll sort of run through the steps of the argument here. All right. Books one to three are targeted toward beginners. Book four is and onward are targeted toward experts. The topics are all planned from the start, right? So his conception of the book itself um, has not changed from beginning to end, although it's been you know, modified somewhat. Uh, the physical rather than simply astronomical focus has been planned from the start as well. Uh, the question and answer format is retained throughout, right? Which if we'll remember, um, Kepler has argued at the beginning is uh, used so that beginners will understand difficult material. And he doesn't drop that once he gets to book four and the more complicated stuff, he retains the question and answer format. Uh, the context, as I've said, the letters to Remus and Bianchi, the banning of the first three books of the epitome, the admonition to booksellers in Italy about the harmony of the world, Right. If we have all this in the back of our heads, then what we see is that Kepler is hoping to sidestep the censure of the book by the index by framing the epitome, especially the book's post-censure, um, as targeted toward an expert audience. And his hope is that this will actually help promote Copernicanism to those experts and lead to the revocation of the Copernican ban more broadly so that his books can reach everybody. And in fact, um, in the preface to book four, which again, we'll remember is written uh, with the ban in mind and with the target on expert readers, Kepler emphasizes very strongly um, that it is the wrong approach for the church to take to ban ways of thinking about nature. He says, antiquity has proven um, that this, this never goes well. I'll give you the quote, the boundaries to investigation must not be fixed in the small minds of a few men. The true boundaries of speculation are the structure of the world itself. Antiquity has taught us by example how man fixes boundaries in vain where God has not established them. All right, so his argument to the expert readers he in Italy that he hopes the book will reach is reevaluate where you've placed your boundaries, right? My book uh, extends the glory of God and does not diminish it. You should let this book be read by everyone. So um, I think, right, if we want to think about conclusions to this story, um, the first is simply that Kepler is not you know, as some earlier um, writers have suggested, some, you know, ivory tower scholar writing his books without awareness of what's going on in the world around him. He has, you know, try, he has his fingers on the pulse of what's happening. He's trying to mold his work to political and religious developments. He's responding to the world around him. And we can see how he saw himself with respect to that world too, and what it meant to him to be a Copernican, right? Kepler uh, was a Lutheran and a German. Uh, 
Um, but he specifically worked on the epitome and framed it so that it would reach Catholics and Italians, right? He could, as I said, have easily given up on those readers and said, you know what, they have their own problems, my book will be read here. But he specifically took on the mantle of Copernican advocate for Italians and Catholics, as well as for Lutherans. Um, and this was because the Copernican community, in his view, was not restricted by nationality or by confession. Um, the Copernican community uh, was one formed by a deep belief in the truth and a belief that what Copernicans were doing were revealing the structure of God's cosmos. Um, Kepler believed that it was a religious imperative for everybody in that community to act as an advocate for each other. He wrote that to Galileo in his very first letter to him um, and to vocally further the Copernican cause. And that's what he saw himself as doing here. So to end, I want to um, raise one other point, which is that um, given all of this, um, the title can present a bit of a conundrum because uh, it's called the epitome of Copernican astronomy. And yet, as you go through the books, you see that it's, it's not actually Copernican so much as Keplerian, right? Um, what Kepler did uh, was not parrot the ideas of his predecessor. Um, he gave heliocentric theory a physical basis. And with his description of planetary orbits as ellipses, he transformed it into something else entirely. Um, so, and Kepler himself realized that this might raise the question of just what kind of astronomy this was. Um, and he, uh, so he does this as a question and answer in the book. All right, question. By what right do you make this also a part of Copernican astronomy, when nevertheless that author continued in the opinion of the ancients concerning perfect circles? And what Kepler answers is, I admit that this form of the hypothesis is not Copernican, but it is bound to the Copernican doctrines with necessary physical arguments, which come from the rest of the sun and the motion of the earth. Thus, these things can be referred to with good merit as Copernican, right? In other words, Kepler saw all of his work as Copernican and believed that what he had done was taken Copernicus to its logical conclusion, right? He had allowed the seed planted by Copernicus to germinate um, and saw himself in some respects as clarifying the work of the master rather than fundamentally changing it. So with this in mind, I wanna suggest that there is another genre um, that uh, suggests itself um, with, through which we might consider the epitome of Copernican astronomy rather than a textbook. Um, and that genre is the commentary or the exegesis. Right. Um, if you think about it, um, Regimontanus and Poirbach's Epitome of Astronomy was really a commentary on Ptolemy, right? Rather than a, a, a reform, rather than a restatement of it. Um, and commentaries and exegeses are still, you know, very popular genres in the 16th and 17th century, particularly Ar Aristotelian commentaries, but also biblical ones, right? And let's not forget that Kepler is a theology student at Tübingen. He's well immersed in biblical commentaries. The biblical commentary is, in fact, the genre that most often uses the question and answer format. Um, Kepler often described himself as a priest of God with respect to the book of nature. And because of this, some people have suggested that uh, we might see all of his books as sort of commentaries on God's book, right? Commentaries on the book of nature. But if Kepler saw himself as some kind of astronomer priest, I want to suggest that he saw Copernicus as the high priest, right? Here's the relevant quote. This glory is sufficient that I can wield my discovery to guard the gates of the temple where Copernicus offers sacrifices at the high altar, right? And the image uh, you might keep in mind, not enough time to talk about it fully, right, is this temple of astronomy, uh, which Kepler places um, as the frontispiece to his uh, Rudolphine tables, which has Copernicus and Tycho Brahe seated, right, um, at the front, at the front um, next to their, uh, next to their, you know, marble pillars, and which has Kepler at the bottom left, right, built into the foundation of the temple, supporting their work. Now, this image is a little more complicated than that, certainly, but it certainly, it does convey the idea of Kepler somehow, um, you know, worshiping um, at the temple of Copernicus. All right, the idea is that Copernicus had first uh, articulated the true meaning of God's creation, um, and Kepler had continued it, um, and that Kepler's work is in some sense not just an exegesis of the book of nature, but an exegesis of the book of, Cop of Copernicus, right? An explanation of what Copernicus really meant conveyed so forcefully that everybody, even the theologians in Italy, would be compelled ultimately to worship at the same altar that Kepler did. Thank you.